Friday is an open forum. This is actually something we have done over the years. Uh, each week we do one topic and then one open forum. We've been spending a lot of time uh, since e Evoke's inception. We've spent a lot of our webinars just going over topic webinars. But this is a chance for you to ask any questions that are on, that's on your mind, anything that I've spoken about, something that may have, have come up on, on a phone call with your Evoke therapist, something in your child's letter, or anything related to the mental health, the treatment of your child or, or parenting. I'm happy to address those. So in the times leading up to it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to submit those questions to Andrea. She'll then feed those questions to me when, when it's time, uh, when we have time in the webinar for open form. Uh, for open discussion. I'm going to answer pre-submitted questions that were sent in uh, before the webinar started. Some of these are very frequently asked questions, uh, very commonly asked questions, some questions that I've been asked personally in my work with parents over the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to get to those, get to the pre-submitted ones, and get to any of your live questions. This may not go the full hour. I don't, I don't suspect that it will, but I'm happy to stay on as long as you have questions. First question, how is the length of stay decided? How do you know when a child is ready to leave? You know, the, the length of stay is decided in the case of an adolescent ultimately by the parent. And I, I think probably what this question speaks to is the recommendation from the therapist. For the young adult, we, we typically have shorter lengths of stay because for young adults, um, they're, they're a part of the process. And so you're trying to balance the buy-in, the acceptance of, of being at Evoke. Uh, the investment of being an evoke and then transitioning to the next phase of their life, whatever that is. So they're going to have more say. We're going to be more sensitive to, to to what's going on with them. Of course, in extreme cases, parents holding a strong boundary about when they're going to support their young adult child leaving can be appropriate. But oftentimes, they're going to have more of a say. Uh, they're going to be more part of the discussion. How do you know when a child is ready to leave? It's similar to the first question. You know, I always talk about this idea being a, a complex matrix. It's not simple that children that are struggling stay longer or children that are doing well leave earlier. At times, you're going to have children that are doing very well that are going to stay longer. And you're going to have children that are struggling significantly. They're going to have a shorter length of stay. And so it, it's a complex answer to the question because you're, you're looking at progress. You know, what, what markers specifically with that child are, are you looking for them to, to accomplish, to achieve while they're with us? You're going to look at what the next phase is, what the next step is for them. What kind of school or program or situation are they going to be transitioning to? And that makes a big difference about the level of readiness and preparedness. Sometimes students, students that do very, very well with us, we're going to want them to stay longer to get past that kind of initial excitement of it all, to get to the quote unquote boring part of it. Sometimes length of stay will be factored in by just the availability of the aftercare school or program. Sometimes you're looking at a, a, a a situation, a process of diminishing gains that you're not seeing as, as much benefit. Sometimes if they're getting close to 18, you're going to want to transition them earlier because you want them to have more time in the, in the, in the next placement school setting, uh, what have you, so that they can spend time building up relationships. So that might be a shorter length of stay, for example. Um, so so that it's very complex. Ideally, this is a discussion that you're having with your therapist three or four weeks into the program. And they can answer by saying, we're not ready yet. Sometimes parents are asking this question because they have to make plans. You know, they have to make typically, in most cases, transitioning out of a vote is going to happen in conjunction with a parent visit, more so with adolescents than for young adults. Young adults can often transition without the parent. So having the parent out before the, the young adult transitions. What I say to parents whose schedule is such that they need to know a long time in advance is let's schedule. Let's, let's predict with all the information we have right now our best guess at what transition might look like. And let's have you schedule a visit. Then as, that, as the week approaches, we can decide what that visit is about. Right, we can decide if that is a transition visit or if that's a visit uh, that, that you visit and maybe your child might leave a week or two after that based on, again, even logistical or, or, or pragmatic needs. So if it's about your needing to schedule time off at work or, or travel, we can schedule it. And then the, the, the meaning of that visit can, can change, can be different. So 
the discussion is one that you have with your therapist. You listen to their opinion and you listen to their recommendations. You listen to their analysis and then you make a determination based on all of that information. Ultimately, you get to decide. And it's not as simple as kind of one measure because every child, every situation, every practical situation is different. So very common question. There's actually a webinar on uh, the life cycle at Evoke, the beginning, middle, and end of your child's day at Evoke. So you're welcome to look at that for, for more information. Should my child have a, have a say in the choice of aftercare? Let me answer that on two levels because, again, with young adults, more so, more often. Typically, parents will research, hear about, learn about with their child about potential aftercare situations. And then the parents will often present more than one to their young adult child and say, you know, these are the ones that we're willing to support. Okay, that's a, that's a typical scenario. And, and sometimes that's just one if you feel so strongly. Let me say this clearly. If you do say that you're giving your child a choice of two or three, make sure that you really are comfortable enough with those three. Even if you have a preference, you have to be comfortable enough with those uh, to, to give them. Don't, don't give them with the intention of, of not really supporting any of their choice. With an adolescent, you know, the, the, the better that they're doing, the more invested they are, are in their therapy and in their work, the more their, their voice, their, their opinion holds weight. This, there's an important principle here that I always talk about, which is I think it's valuable always to ask your child what they think, to ask your child what their opinion is, what they like, what they're looking for, and, and run it through what I call the parent or the adult filter. I mean, I think it tells us a lot about their priorities, about what they value. I think children that will say things like, I have to have X, Y, and Z, or I'm not going to do well, are less ready for more opportunities. The, 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 the ideal that I often arrived at with my students was, was something along the line of a child saying, you know, here are my preferences, here's what I would like. Um, and yet uh, the most important feature in aftercare is going to be me, my attitude. When a child would kind of threaten that their success was dependent upon having certain rights or certain options, certain features, then I was talking about them in terms of their, you know, that's not necessarily evidence of clinical progress. That, that's more fragile, a, a narrower bandwidth. And the threat sounds a lot like some of, probably in many cases, a lot of the old kind of dynamics between you and your parents. There's kind of a, a blackmailing that goes on there. Like, I'm going to fail unless you give me what I want. If all else is equal and there are features that, that you can listen to and, you know, sports, art, if all else is equal, then why not give them to that, you know, give them that opportunity. If you can find one that has those qualities, typically a, a, a therapist and a, and a consultant, uh, they're looking at a list of priorities because not every school can meet everybody's needs and wants, but you're looking at kind of what's most important and you're prioritizing. And sports, for example, might be high on that list and it may not right it might be art music whatever it is might not be you know might be high on that list but you, you kind of see what they have to say see what that tells you about them and then you make the choice that that you feel best about sometimes adolescents are given a couple of choices it's interesting because their, their choices are often not based on a lot of information and a lot of insight. So, you know, they're, they're going to look at a brochure or maybe they've heard about a program from somebody else who heard about a program, one of their peers, or, or maybe one of their peers went to it. And in, in those cases, you know, that's why I, I don't necessarily think that, that on the surface that what they want, what they're asking for ought to be granted or, or ought to ho hold a lot of weight. But it is an important conversation to have. I think there's something important here too. The, the ability, the willingness, the, the process of asking a, a child what they want, what they think, what they feel, and listening and considering that, although you're running it through your, your adult, your parent filter, I think also reinforces something they learn at Evoke, which is they don't have to have everything that they ask for. And that their voice being heard doesn't necessarily mean that they'll get what they want. Um, but they like that idea. And that's something that many of them learn while they're with us. 
Why does it seem that aftercare is a foregone conclusion that evoke? And I assume that the, the, the word aftercare refers to therapeutic, some kind of therapeutic placement, because aftercare is anything that happens after evoke. Um, but having, having qualified that, you know, I've said this. When I began in wilderness therapy uh, some 22 years ago, it was my bias that children would go home after, after wilderness therapy. It was my theoretical bias, intellectual bias, that children would go home. And when I saw them do as phenomenal as, as many of them do in wilderness, uh, that, that idea was reinforced. But I saw, of course, over a relatively short period of time, a, a period of about six or eight months, I saw the kinds of challenges, the kinds of regression back to some old behaviors, some old peer groups, some old family dynamics. I saw some that, that really compromised their situation. I got letters, I got phone calls from parents. I got letters from, from clients that told me how much harder it was than they thought. One client specifically said, you know, don't, don't encourage, don't, don't encourage the idea that children ought to go home after this. It's a, it's a steeper mountain to climb for, for people that like me, people that have been in this situation. So really it's experience over time that has biased us towards aftercare programs, right? That we, we get a lot of a wonderful assessment, a wonderful initial gain for, for everybody, for the family, for the child, but that maintaining those gains can often, best often, uh, most often be best supported by, by longer placement. That gives everybody time. And, and I'll say this because I think this is implied in this question, unless I'm just reading into it, you know, some of my old, old ideas about people asking this question. I want to say this. I, I know that families want to get back to, to kind of normal life. But in my experience over more than two decades, children are not generally are not happier when they go home. Neither are families. Right? It's challenging. It doesn't get easier. It gets harder. And so the idea that somebody's going to be happier going to their old high school or, or even another high school in their community or any high school for that matter at home um, is going to be a happier setting for them than being a therapeutic program isn't true. It's not my experience visiting schools, visiting uh, programs, listening to, to letters, to phone calls from from families and from clients over the years, thousands of, of clients. So I would, I would challenge what I think might be an assumption of this, of this question, which is that, that it's going to be not only more successful, but more enjoyable to go home. Eventually, of course, they're going to be out of therapeutic placement. Eventually, the family is going to have to figure that out. Eventually, there's going to be some, some challenges that families are going to have to be reintroduced to and work at. But it's, it's, it's work, right? It's, it's, it's a challenge. It's not all celebration, even though the initial decision might be exciting to the adolescent or to the family. What should I tell my family and friends about my child's time at Evoke? I want to respect her privacy, but I don't want to lie. That's an interesting. The, the second part of it is, is, is what challenges me. I, I don't think it's necessarily a lie if you're vague. You know, forgive the silliness of the analogy, but you don't tell family and friends about what's going on in your, in your, in your sex life or in your, in your private thoughts. You don't tell people that. That's not necessarily a lie. So you can protect your family's confidentiality, your child's confidentiality. You can also ask your child what they think about it. In extremes is where the acting out involves school problems, peer problems, legal problems, community problems. In some ways, I think they've already kind of forfeited their, their confidentiality. And in many cases, children think that when their parents don't want to tell about what's going on, the, the child often interprets that as the parent is ashamed of them and of their situation. Even if you don't think that that's true, that can often be the case. So asking your child what they think, I, I think you still you have the right to tell some of your close confidants what's going on, right? You can't, this is partly your story too. You don't have to tell the details about everything that led up to it. But if you can't tell your very close friends or those people that you trust, your own therapist, for example, then that robs you of some of your opportunity. You could still maintain some of their confidentiality. 
And finally, I'll say this. My experience has shown me that when families talk about this relatively openly in their community, that people come out of the woodwork sharing similar stories, asking questions. You often become a resource. Are there going to be people that are going to respond judgmentally? No doubt about that. That's going to happen in some cases. Um, but, but those are not your people. Those are not people with the depth and the richness that, that you have now and that your child is developing, you and your child are developing in this process, and that, that going through this process offer to you. So I would like to open you up to that idea. Having a discussion with your child, not robbing yourself of an opportunity to tell some people that, are, that you're close to while still maintaining confidentiality by, by talking about the details. You can be as vague as saying, well, our child is away at a school. Our child is away at a camp. You know, learning about leadership, learning about self-esteem. You can be as, as general as you want, of course, in the process. And, and in many cases that I've seen when people have become very transparent, it's really opened things up a lot. I, I think the stigma that is still associated with, <clears throat> with mental health um, with treatment, I was talking to a, a client recently, and he was sharing this idea that he, he wants to tell everybody in his life that he goes to therapy regularly, and and kind of challenge their assumptions about what that means about a person. That it's not a sign of weakness; it's a sign of strength and resourcefulness, and resiliency, and openness, and and, and strength that comes from vulnerability. So, I, I'm biased toward that kind of approach, but. Everybody gets to make their own decision. And, and you can't fight all battles on all fronts all the time. So you also have to weigh how much energy you have to engage with people to be transparent. In many cases, it can go positively, but of course, sometimes it doesn't because people don't understand. Why does Evoke have so much parent curriculum? To me, this imply, it implies that we are the problem. I, I've been asked this question before. First of all, I think of it as parent support. You know, the analogy that, that, that I like to identify with is, Children require bandwidth, right, of any parent, any child and any parent. Children that struggle require more bandwidth. And for you to have more bandwidth, you're going to have to stretch yourself and get support. Uh, and, and I think that inadvertently we do become part of the problem. Yeah, I do have the belief that we dent our children. We ourselves were dented by our parents, and they were dented by their parents, and so on and so on. And so in my mind, there's not a lot of shame in the fact to recognize I'm going to debt my children. My limitations are absolutely going to have an effect on my child. And so it becomes my life's project to continue to work on myself in that way. And, and it translates, in my experience, it translates to every relationship. That's why I think about like in my book and I get people commenting on it. It doesn't have anything to do necessarily with, with or it's not confined to just being about children. It's, it's really about every relation. It's really about me. So part of it is we're part of the problem, but there's no shame in that. Part of it is we, we need more sources of support because our children that are struggling require more, they require more capacity than, and then say a child that's not struggling. And because they require more capacity, we're going to have to go to more sources for support, for information a place where we can take care of ourselves. Because if we ask our children to take care of us in this process, right, by, by venting at them, by sharing and letting our anxiety kind of overflow to them, they can't handle it. They're, they're the least equipped in our circle to handle it. And as parents, that's not their role anyway, is for them to take care of us. So we go to other places to get taken care of. I see it as a part of, you know, a healthy life. And although I don't go to specifically parenting therapy myself, I go to therapy and, of course, parenting questions come up because they're just relationship issues because they're about me, about my issues. Why do you recommend Al-Anon to parents of a child that does not have an alcohol or substance abuse issue? You know, my therapist tells the story that, that years ago at, at the university hospital that she one night at the office, stumbled into the cafeteria, uh, stumbled in upon an Al-Anon meeting where there were a dozen or so people uh, hosting a meeting. And they welcomed her in. And she thought to herself, you know, I, I recommend Al-Anon to people. Maybe I should 
you know, try and see what it's like sometimes. And um, she said she walked out of there learning two things. She learned that she didn't cause her husband's alcoholism. By the way, she wasn't married. She's speaking more metaphorically. And you can't argue with a drunk. And she didn't have, of course, a person in her life personally that was struggling with alcohol. But the metaphor is you can't argue with a drunk because you can't argue with somebody whose thinking is impaired. You can't reason with somebody who's unreasonable. And that idea of I didn't cause the alcoholism applies to borderline, bipolar, depression, anxiety, right? There's a, a non-guilting message in Al-Anon. And there's a redirection to self. So if you replace alcohol and alcoholism or substance abuse, if you replace that with self-destructive behaviors, you know, limitations, self-sabotage, even if your child's issue is, is a fairly innocent one, so to speak, like anxiety, right? We see children being more of a, a victim to anxiety than we would say somebody acting out demonstratively with anger or with substance abuse, right? We, we tend to think of those as more choiceful problems, that they had some choice in that. But in some ways, I would make a strong argument that both of those things are happening to them to, to a large degree. But even when we see a more kind of innocent, what we deem as an innocent disorder, it still teaches us how to be in relationship to somebody who's struggling, right? It, it's like my book talks about the, the, the premise changing from what do I do to, number one, who am I? And, and Al-Anon does that. You know, we look at ourselves. We stay on our side of the street. We discover our family rules, our family roles, our family background, and how it contributed to who we are on a daily basis. So the question is, who am I? The second question is, who is my child? Who is my other? And the more clearly we can, we can figure out who we are, the more clearly we are able to see them. And then lastly, what's my relationship to their challenge, to their struggle, to their mental health issue, to their behavioral issue, to their substance issue? Am I participating in that? Am I inadvertently reinforcing aspects of that that I don't want to see continue? Is my guilt debilitating? Am I anxious? Am I trying to control it? Am I angry about it? Am I fanning the flames inadvertently? All of those kinds of questions come up. And so if you can, if you can understand the metaphor, even if you go to an Al-Anon meeting where everybody is the spouse of an alcoholic, kind of a classic Al-Anon profile, if you can translate that into what's it like to be in relationship with somebody that you love. And yes, the decisions are different when you're talking about your alcoholic husband or wife than when you're talking about your 14-year-old you know, anxious daughter who's cutting on themselves and has an eating disorder. Those are different decisions that you make. But the fundamental and core concepts and principles are the same. And when you can see that, you actually get it. You, then then you're, you have a different sensibility that, that arises in you. Right? You understand the principles involved. And that's really what I would say. There's also codependence anonymous that can be more general. There's families anonymous. What can be, which can be more applicable to a lot of the families. But for me, the concepts are the same. I've gone to Al-Anon and I don't have an alcoholic spouse or an alcoholic child. I have alcoholic clients, of course. I have codependent clients. But in my mind, everybody is my qualifier, right? My wife goes to Al-Anon too. She's a therapist and I'm not an alcoholic. She doesn't have an alcoholic child. But everybody is her qualifier because she's, fundamentally affected by her own codependency, as am I. So that's really what it's about. All right, I'll, I'll go to upcoming events and then any topics at, at the end we can. Speaking of, we ask all parents to go to six 12-step support groups. You can go to alanon.org, codo.org, familiesanonymous.org to find meetings and information in your area, meeting times in your area. nami.org, you can also go to to find for resource classes, information, support in your area. Uh, we, we encourage you to, to, to follow us on a podcast. All of our webinars are on podcasts. If you have an iPhone or an iOS device, go to the podcast app and search Evoke Therapy Programs. If you have an Android device, download the SoundCloud app and search Evoke Therapy Programs. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram for updates, inspirational stories, links to blogs and articles. 
Um, also for announcements for upcoming meetings and events that evoke sponsors and supports. On Facebook, you can search Evoke Therapy Programs and follow us there for, for more of that information. You can also go to the Second Nature Fun Alumni Foundation on Facebook, which is an organization that's set up by, by former families and parents to help people that can't afford treatment. You can also go to our blog. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is available on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. You can also get an audio version. Or you can go to the Parent Alumni Foundation on uh, pay, book page on Amazon and, and buy one of the recommended books there. And a portion of the proceeds go, go to the Alumni Foundation to help people that can't afford therapy. If you haven't done so also, I'd invite you to go to Amazon and give my book an honest review. Parent support groups coming up. One is this Thursday in Nashville. Uh, New York City, I'll be there on September 13th. Well, that's a Wednesday. Los Angeles, our typical Los Angeles Sunday afternoon potluck followed by a parent meeting in uh, Studio City outside of Los Angeles. In the Bay Area on Monday, September 25th, the, the location and, and time of that will be announced by, by Thursday. Uh, Washington, D.C., we will be tentatively, we're going to plan on being there October 11th. Also, the Wilderness Play, maybe it's last showing because it's having a hard time raising money. So it might be the only showing. So if you want to take a vacation uh, to Washington, D.C., take your children. It's playing that week through Saturday. Um, and then in Chicago, tentatively, uh, the week of November 13th, and then in Toronto sometime this fall. Email Andrea at evoketherapy.com for more information for questions or to RSVP. Uh, we just finished our, our Finding You in Toronto. We have the next Finding You is September 17th through 20th. You can also get a, a private intensive for your family or a pursuits trip. Uh, go to our, our website for more information or email intensives at evoketherapy.com. Our next workshop will be uh, September 23rd at Entrada, October 21st at Cascades, and then back to Entrada in, in November. You can coordinate a visit with your child if your therapist th thinks that's appropriate. Uh, pursuits trips are evoke-led trips that are for young adults or families where we do high adventure. Currently, there's a Nepal trip happening right now, um, so they can be international, and, and, and you can really pick your amount of therapeutic support and what kind of activities you or your family or your children want to do. All right, no extra questions have come in. I hope this is helpful. We're going to be doing more open forums now that we've caught up with, with a lot of our, our topics. I'll also take suggestions on topics. Uh, on Thursday, I'm going to be talking about wilderness therapy, aftercare, and coming home, which obviously you can see from tonight's questions and from a lot of the questions I get is are some of the most common questions, some of the most anxious topics that parents have. So this Thursday, August 31st at 7 p.m., we'll be doing that webinar. Thanks for joining us this evening. Hope this is a helpful point of contact. Have a great week. Take care. Bye-bye.